wanted to take a bit of a different position on PDF accessibility today, especially at these web conferences. A lot of people uh, get a great hate on for PDF, particularly web developers, uh, because you know Mike's a web developer and he hates PDF. But I, I, I want to share a few case studies, case studies of, of what we have seen as a success. A lot of people think PDF is going away, and the reality is it isn't. It's an archivable format. Uh, there are, what, what was the last number? 75 million new PDFs are created every day uh, globally. That's a huge number. So to try and pretend that it is going away as a web developer is very short-sighted. We need to be working together and say, what content makes the most sense as a web page? What makes the most sense as an app? What makes the most sense as a PDF? I, I always like to use the reference of, of this large document we did once, and it was a 700-page document. And someone said, well, let's make it HTML. I said, it's already PDF, so why are you going to reinvent the wheel? So, well, we need it to be accessible. So we can make the PDF accessible. So why would you then retranscribe the file? So we're, we're trying to look at how are people creating content, how are people authoring content, and how are people producing and, and then sharing and distributing that content. And contrary to the web world's belief, PDF is still the format of choice for most large organizations. So, is this going to work? Yes. <coughs> Lay of the PDF land. HTML versus PDF. Uh, this is our biggest fight. And I, I love HTML. I have absolutely no issue with it. But we need to find a, a reliable solution for dealing with the PDF mountain. And what happens often with organizations is that they look at their PDF collection, they've got 60,000 files on the website today, and they're buried, and they don't know where to start. And our, our answer is always, as, as an organization that remediates PDFs, is start with one. Start with one. Look at what your top priority document is an annual report or your accessibility filing for the year, uh, your equity reports, those are always good ones to start with. And, and you can start chipping away. The, the challenge is a lot of people just say, I don't understand it, so I'm not even going to bother. And, and that attitude has got to change in PDF. We've got a great new PDF standard. It's the most thorough standard there is from an accessibility standpoint, obviously in my opinion, because I'm biased. But I don't look at WCAG as a standard. I look at WCAG as a set of guidelines. PDF UA is a standard. It's an ISO standard. What is accessible for this context? What is it? It's an 800-page document that tries to outline every single aspect of PDF and what makes one component accessible versus the other. So we're, we're talking or we're trying to change the landscape of PDF accessibility to get people to understand that it's fully accessible, it's fully readable, there's no issue with distribution, we have no language issues. We can do it, but you can't do it overnight. And the one-day training courses that try and teach PDF accessibility just don't cut it. You've got to dedicate yourself to it. So that's kind of the intro. So what we're hearing, knowledge is power. This is clearly Francis Bacon, um, <laughs> at least in my mind it is. Uh, we're, we're hearing that everyone is looking to be trained. And, and unfortunately, I, I slightly have to disagree with Darren from earlier with these, these train courses that are popping up, saying, well, let's just train everyone on staff. The problem with that is we've got buy-in problems. We, we deal with a, a lot of large organizations who have spent an inordinate amount of money on training. And people go back to their desks the next day, and they're all excited about their accessibility, and yeah, we're, we're going to do this. And then they realize, wait, I still have my other job to do. When do I have time to worry about the accessibility of the document that I just authored? I'm not trying to dissuade people from training. That's not my, my position at all. But you have to be realistic. How many people in their organization have a lot of time on their hands? Anyone? No? Nobody's got a lot of spare time to work on their accessibility training? That's weird. I, I never thought I'd see that answer. This is part of the biggest challenge. We've actually dealt with a client whose entire department revolted and said, we're not doing it. You hired me to do my job. That's what I'm really good at. Now, they're, they're unionized, so they can do that. But we're doing our job the best that we can. I'm not going to worry about the accessibility side. I'll let someone else figure it out. The difference is they at least now know that they have to be accessible, and they're building that into their process. They're saying, if we need to go live on the 5th, when do we need to have this content made accessible to make sure that we hit that 5th deadline, as opposed to the typical last-minute government approach, which is, hey, the minister's giving a talk tomorrow. I have an 800-page report I need accessible tonight, which cannot be done. We've tried. So 
Training everyone is really important from an awareness standpoint <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, but technical standards require technical commitment. You need people who understand it. And, and the difference between PDF accessibility and web accessibility is at least most web developers have a foundation of, of how to build a great website. Adding the accessibility components is an additional step. You can't go to university and learn how to be a PDF developer. It doesn't happen. I know some of the top PDF developers in the world and, and great friends of mine, and they have no concept of accessibility in a PDF content. So organizations that we've seen have great success with PDF accessibility have said, we've got a team of two. That's all they're going to do. They're going to dedicate themselves to understanding what we're going to do with PDF and making those files accessible. So instead, when, when people get through their training course, they get this feeling. Oh my god, it's an 800-page standard. What am I going to do? PDF accessibility is not a WCAG standard. WCAGs, or, or the W3C's approach to PDF accessibility in my positioning is completely backwards. You cannot distill it to 23 checkpoints. PDF UA, and I'll get into that in a second, our standard has 287 checks because there's a technical component to the file. Adobe doesn't own PDF anymore. It's a public standard. It's ISO standard at 32,000. It's great. But it is technical. So is my file accessible? That's what you need to, or is my file compliant? And then can I make it accessible after that? So it becomes a bit of an overload. Um, who here is tagged a PDF? Who here knows what tagging a PDF is before I get that part? Yeah? So tags are, are that kind of bundle that we talk about saying this is a heading, this is a paragraph, this is a list. And a lot of people have looked on maybe a, a large implementer's site, they've got, a, they've got a big PDF brand, and uh, there's a button that says, add tags to document. And if, in my opinion, that is the single worst thing that has ever been developed for accessibility. It's that easy button that everyone's looking for that doesn't exist. It tries, but in no way, shape, or form is it good. Uh, it's, it actually does more harm than good to your accessibility because it's guessing. And they haven't rebuilt the engine for guessing that tagging structure in three versions of Acrobat. Ooh, I branded it. Sorry. Um, so making sure you're understanding the technical components of the accessibility side of the PDF is really important. So we've got some institutional realities. And, and I love the Glacier approach because it's true. Most organizations say, okay, I've got the AODA laws in front of me. What do we need to do to make sure that we're accessible? But we've got some real problems. Budget freezes. Who here can hire 15 people tomorrow? Nobody. You don't have the money and you don't have the capacity. We've got limitations of training. Most training programs that are available for PDF, I, I would argue 95% of them, do not teach you what you need to do to make a file accessible and compliant. And there is a very big difference between adding tags and making sure that all readers can access that content. Uh, the other issue is core competencies. You were hired to be a, I don't know, city planner. How does that make you qualified to be an accessibility expert? And, and this, this mentality of everyone needs to do this, I, I struggle with because it is a technical skill, right? I wasn't a PDF guy five years ago. But it's all I've done for the last five years. So understanding the ins and outs of it is really important. Web developers here who are, are experts in accessibility within the web have done the exact same thing. It's not something you just add on at the end. So focusing on that, most organizations don't have enough resourcing to say, all you're going to do is focus on PDF accessibility. <coughs> I've got some case studies that we'll go through and, and talk about some organizations that are dealing with that. They've brought on two people to just focus on their PDF file but they still can't bring in enough people to deal with all of the files they create. So, PDF UA. Has anyone heard of PDF UA? One, two, great. Do not ask for WCAG compliant PDF files. It's not a thing. We have an ISO stand. It's really exciting if you're up at four in the morning every night. PDF UA was, was started in 2008 uh, as, a, as an initial uh, approach to how do we make a PDF file accessible. After PDF was, was uh, opened up as an ISO standard by Adobe to the ISO, ISO 32000-1, it was then decided, okay, we need to make this accessible. And how are we going to talk about accessibility in a PDF context? Apples and oranges, right? How can I have web accessibility in a different format? 
They're different. How we talk about source document accessibility is very different than how we talk about web accessibility in PDF. You cannot go from a Word document with every single style included and every single markup and alt text and make a compliant file. Can't do it. The most compliance you will get from a Word fully styled and fully formatted file is 60%. You still have to work on it afterwards, and a lot of people don't realize that. The, the checker that's built into Acrobat does not check for PDF UA. There's a free tool. You don't even have to buy a license, and you can figure out how to make your, your file successful uh, or whether they're compliant or not. And that that uh, application is called PATH, uh, the PDF Accessibility Checker. It's now in version 2. It is reliable. There, there, occasionally the odd bug that will crash it, but uh, for the most part, 100% reliable on, on figuring out whether your file is PDF UA compliant or not. So when we talk about AODA, AODA was written in 2005. The Info Communication Standard was built uh, in 2012. So PDF UA didn't exist. And we're seeing organizations say, well, I only have to make it WCAG accessible. But WCAG doesn't even mention PDF, right? It just talks about web technologies. So are you asking for the right thing? Procurement departments aren't asking for the right thing. And if someone tells you that they can't make their file PDF UA compliant, it's just because they don't know how. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be asking that's, a, that's an issue of, un, of their knowledge rather than are we doing the best that we can. It's like the difference between WCAG A and AA. Are we doing the best that we can? So we're, we're trying to, part of my mission over the last few years is trying to get the word out about PDF UA. Uh, I've crossed the world this year and, and tried to get it out there because as jurisdictions are looking for how do we build an accessibility standard and how do we look at our PDF files, we want to start with the right thing, UA, always PDF UA. UA stands for Universal Accessibility. We know there's a problem in mobile. I get it. We're working on it. We're working on a mobile viewer that will, will finally allow us to get through that barrier of, I need my content on a mobile device. I still struggle to understand why anyone would want to read a 300-page report on their iPhone. But if you want to do it, we're going to try and make sure that you can. And, and this, this challenge that we've had of, of uh, adoption of PDF as, a, as an accessibility standard has really been propagated by, we don't know what to do with it, so let's, let's ignore it. There's personal preference. I like reading a Word document. Great. But your personal preference is not a standard. We have a standard for the format. We're already working on the second version. It'll be out in two years. There's a big commitment from the international community, particularly in Europe, that is only going to go with PDF UA, and we will have PDF UA in the next disk of US Section 508. The US is going to go to PDF UA. We've been working really hard on making sure that that happens. And Canada has to do the same thing. <coughs> so, get into the case studies. The Ontario government. Um, we, we do a lot of work with province and, and one of the challenges that they've got is again limited resources currently they're on a seven week delay for getting a file back seven weeks for a five page document that's crazy and that's not sustainable so what what we did with with particularly the Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation and uh, uh, they change their name every six months EDT uh, they have t uh, one person on staff who tags all of their files that are less than 20 pages that is the capacity that they have internally. That is how many people they've been allowed to hire. That is the number of people that they've been allowed to train. And every piece of work that is produced by this ministry goes through her. She's great. She understands the standard. She understands what we're trying to do with UA. And she's committed to it. But again, she's one person. So they had to look at how do we sustainably develop a policy to make sure that all of our PDF content is going out accessibly. So anything less than 20 pages, they do internally. Anything over 20 pages is outsourced. We, we have, that, have that contract right now, but it, it did go out for bid. So we're seeing this shift. What can we do internally for quick things? What can we do externally? I like to, to refer to this in the same way that, I, that we would look at printing. Who has a giant printing press in their office? That has backfired on me three times. Mm -hmm. TTC. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> But nobody does that, right? We outsource it. If you want something glossy, you send it out to Kinko's. You don't do this internally. So this mentality that everyone has to do it internally doesn't make sense from a business sustainability standpoint. 
we've got expertise, you're a company that's, a, that's really focused on doing one thing and you do it really well, or multiple things, but is accessibility that thing that you want to have a, an internal team for? French translation is a great example. That's how we look at it. It's a service, just like French translation. Most organizations don't have that internally, right? We want people thinking about accessibility. We want people designing with accessibility in mind. But the actual production, when they go out for print, they send the file to us for remediation. And I'm not using this as a plug. I'm, I'm suggesting that you have to look at your document accessibility strategy in the same way that you look at other business problems. It's, it's how do we create a sustainable model to make sure that whatever we're producing is accessible. Web, PDF, Word, doesn't matter. It all has to go out accessibly. So that's been their approach. Deloitte. Um, Deloitte's one of the largest consulting firms in the world, and they had a problem. They had to be compliant by the end of December. They had 60,000 PDF files sitting on their current website. They were going through a web renewal, and they said, oh, right, PDF. What do we do? They tried to determine whether this is something that they, they could do internally. The answer was, no, we're a bunch of accountants. I'm not worried about this. But the, the thing that they recognized was that they're producing content for other organizations, and they need to make sure that those reports are accessible. So we, we sat down with Deloitte and, and tried to look at how do we build an easy, sustainable, cost-effective approach to every single PDF file that they produce. And what we've done is we've created a dedicated web portal. The portal is designed to allow internal access only for every single person on staff to upload their files in the same way that they do French translation. Ironically, Deloitte has an internal French translation team because they offer it as a service to their financial services clients. But we were looking at how do we make sure that they can get through their content. So we did a first run. They had 60,000 files. We remediated 60,000 files. And they went live on their new website with all of their content accessible. It was a huge amount of effort. Now, on a daily basis, we're seeing files come in. But the actual ongoing cost for having this is minimal. Most organizations do not produce that much public-facing content in a day. There are obviously exceptions, but most organizations are publishing less than a dozen files a day. So when you look at how do we create a sustainable solution, Deloitte says, how many people are we going to have to hire to manage our accessibility problem? We know nothing about it. We're going to be starting from scratch, and we have to hit the ground running tomorrow. So we, again, from partner all the way down to designer in Hyderabad, they're able to log in, upload the file, get it remediated within 48 hours, and it's back on their website, regardless of size. So again, they looked at that sustainability piece. Uh, we did a cost uh, analysis for them. They estimate their cost savings to be in the neighborhood of $7 million over the life of the project. So that's a huge number, and that's by them not having to build an internal team. Next, I was hired to do my work. Um, I mentioned this a little earlier about the, the revolt that we saw with one of our clients. Uh, I can't identify who they are. Um, but this organization had spent a lot of money on training, a lot of money on tools, and they were promised accessibility out of the box. And they were promised that we'll train everyone and everyone will do this and don't worry, the whole team will be accessible. Unfortunately, that didn't work because the teams inside said, I don't have time, I can't hire anyone else, I don't know anything about accessibility, and frankly, I don't care. I'm sure we all have, have heard that within our organizations or, or as consultants, we've heard that with our clients. I don't care, just make sure I'm not going to get sued. That, that's, that's common. We have to be realistic about this. That's the world in which we live. It's really hard to forget that when we're, we're at accessibility conferences and everyone's bought into this. This is what we do. And that's great, but the general public, unfortunately, most people don't care. It's an, it's, as was mentioned earlier, it's an attitudinal problem that we have to start shifting, but we can't shift it overnight, right? So how do we deal with this today? The organization had to be compliant. They were completely non-compliant. They have very complex content, uh, very specialized content, and they produce a fair amount of it on a weekly basis. So. The organization spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on licenses and training, and it was shelved. The team said, I'm not touching it. Good luck. We need a sustainable solution that 
gets us, gets us our content at the time we need it at a price point that works. They weren't even consulted about it, so they didn't get any input. And when you're looking at your organization or you're looking at, at your clients and, and saying, how do we build in a sustainable practice? Asking people first, hey, is this something you really want to do? Is this something that you've got time for? Is this something that we can include into our daily process? Because you've got to work backwards. If something has to go live on the 5th, how long is it going to take us to get it accessible? The number of times we've, we've had clients call us and say, okay, we had a designer build this and they said it was going to be accessible. We've tried to run the test and it fails. We sent it back. We've been charged $5,000 for a 100 page report. Why is this not working? By the way, we need it tomorrow. Okay, let's see what we can do. And, and we're seeing a lot of organizations paying consultants to learn how to do it on the job. This is, this is happening a lot with the product. Um, people are winning contracts and then saying, yeah, 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 accessibility, I got that. I, I read something on a blog and, and I can just add tags or I'll use headings and then I've got styles and I'm good. And then they realize, oh, there's more to it. Knowing, knowing what you're up against and, and making sure your procurement practices are sustainable from an accessibility standpoint is really important because we're seeing so much wasted money and that is awful. Accessibility is a business problem. It's not just making sure everyone has access. That's great from a, from a business standpoint as well. But you've got a business problem that says, I have to make sure that I'm accessible. The same way you have to make things bilingual. It's a business problem. And how are you going to solve that in a business context? Many of us in this room are consultants. We work with private industry or government to make sure that their content is accessible. So it's not just one PDF file that you have to make accessible or one web page. It's all of them. And how do we do that in a way that, that gets corporate buy-in because you, you have to have that. And yes, we're going to go with a stick. That's why you're doing it in the same way we did it with French language services. So how do we make sure that people understand that we've got to build a sustainable model for accessibility, not just, hey, I'm a consultant. I'm going to charge you $10,000 and make sure that your, your website is, is there. Okay, but what do I do on an ongoing basis? And what do I do with the next PDF file that I create? So this, this training model isn't working not seeing that take off and that's that's been a big problem that we're trying to address with with a different approach to sustainability within accessibility don't just do it because it's the law do it because it's the right thing to do because everyone has that needs access to your content without question but approach your clients and say I'm addressing your business problem not just your legislative requirement <coughs> Complex subject matter. Um, I love this this one. Uh, we work with a lot of post-secondary education institutions, uh, ironically, primarily in the U.S. And the day that we got the call that a student had graduated their MBA because of the PDF work that we had done, they were able to read their textbooks. They were able to read their assignments. They were able to complete their assignments because we created fillable forms for their tests and exams. They were able to independently their MBA. When we got that call and we saw her LinkedIn profile change, that was the greatest moment of my career at that point. Um, we see an increasing demand for accessibility within education because education has been such a barrier. It's taking longer for someone to complete their course. It's taking longer for someone to have access to the information. And that's just not fair. If just because you can't see or just maybe perhaps you've got a cognitive disability that's making it difficult to interact with the content, that is no reason why we can't make sure that everyone has equal access to education. Here's the problem. Professors are notorious for forgetting to advise the accessibility office what course material a student needs. In the amount of time to accurately produce accessible content. Hey, you've got a surprise quiz tomorrow, okay? When are you going to make it accessible for the student? Oh, right, I forgot. We're doing uh, advanced chemistry at the PhD level right now. And we're, we're integrating ChemML, so chemistry uh, markup language, within PDF. It's awful. And, and <laughs> I'll tell you, my team hates me for taking this contract. But it's important because we now are building something that's never been done before. We've got complete compliant MML markup. 
The same way we did it with math ML before, we're now doing it with chemistry. Again, we're dropping another barrier. Just because the student can't see doesn't mean they're not going to be a great chemistry major. So, unfortunately, we're doing it at the PhD level, and I dropped out of chemistry in the 10th grade, which means I am no use. But again, we hired someone who is a PhD in chemistry, and they can help us with the, with the, uh, with, with the markup. The challenge with this is none of the publishers of textbooks are giving us accurate content. They're giving us the print PDF files, but we have to do so much work. And so many accessibility offices are repaying for the exact same work that has been done for another student at another university. There are organizations uh, that try to um, collect accessible content. But the most common approach to document accessibility in post-secondary education is strip out the content and provide a plain text version. No markup, no context, no alt text, nothing. Plain text transcript. Well, if you're investing that much money as a publisher into making your content look great and have all of these features that are, are rich and trying to help a student better understand the content, why doesn't a person with print disability have the same right to access that content in the same meaningful way? It's different access, but it's the same content. And the short-sightedness, I, I, I've been on a bit of a crusade in, in education because I think this should go upstream. I don't think accessibility should be the last step's responsibility. I think it should be the producer's step, right? If you've got a publisher who's producing 150 textbooks a year, and those textbooks are going to be bought by a thousand universities or a thousand school boards, <laughs> the actual cost for making a textbook accessible per student or per university is less than $10. But for each university to make each textbook accessible, you're looking at $10,000, $15,000, $25,000. I have no idea. How is that sustainable? It's not, but the publishers are reluctant to do it because they're afraid of providing a digital copy to a student that will then post it on the internet so that someone else doesn't have to buy their textbook. That's a huge problem. We have digital rights management and we couldn't sign a contract with one of the publishers because there was a clause in it that said we couldn't have access to the code layer of the file because they claimed it was proprietary. It's not proprietary, it's PDF. You have PDF to file. You don't own that, the ISO standard does. I always use the taxpayer line from Top Gun. Um, <laughs> Top Gun's my favorite movie. Um, and this, this mentality of we can't have access to content because of intellectual property rights, which then prevents a student from learning, is ridiculous. And, and it's such an archaic way of thinking about content. Right. Yep. About CAMML, if you don't mind me asking. Is it like MathML, and you need a separate player uh, in order for the user agent to be able to express it? You need an add-on. So Same agent, different add-on. So do they have their own CAMML add-on, or is it the same kind of MathML, math player, math data <coughs> kind of thing that you add into MathML? So, I can tell you this, there's an open source screen reader, NVDA, who had money thrown at them from Stanford to embed a MathML reader into NVDA. And that, that project has now been extended to ChemML. It is not yet publicly available. It is for use only within post-secondary education by request. They're, the, the problem that they've got, they're, they're looking for basically a little bit more money to make sure that it's robust enough. They don't feel that it's production ready, but Stanford put a, a fairly sizable donation behind it to get it out there. And, and the, the challenge that we've got with the readers, you know, NVDA is an open source uh, screen reader, so they, they are dependent to keep the lights on by public donation. And a lot of people will download software, same with PAC, the PDF Accessibility Checker, and nobody, download, or nobody donates for this. So ChemML and MathML is a great example. Freedom Scientific, I can pretty much guarantee we'll never care about it, but JAWS is the most popular uh, implementation of a screen reader, well, other than iOS and VoiceOver. But VoiceOver doesn't base their reading off of standards. 
Neither does Freedom Scientific. JAWS is now building tools to override semantic markup. And guess, so this investment that we're doing into ChemML and MathML with NVDA is to basically say we have to do this. Otherwise, we've got a natural barrier. Is that going to be for both PDF and browser? Yes. No. PDF, browser, and Word. Okay. Yeah. We're getting there. Probably within the next eight months. And, and this is one of the other challenges that we have. When people aren't basing things off of standards, the developers have a really hard time understanding what direction to go. PDF UA actually focuses on three points of compliance. Do we have accessibility with the file? So the, the PDF file itself. The viewer, so let's use Adobe Reader, uh, because it is, uh, it, at least it gives us access to the accessibility layer, which things like the embedded PDF viewer in Chrome does not. The number of times I get a call, I can't open your invoice. Well, why not? It says, uh, I, need, I need Adobe Reader. Okay, well, what are you opening it? Chrome. Great. So Google doesn't care about standards when it comes to PDF or accessibility, as far as I'm concerned. Is this being recorded? No. Yes. <laughs> we'll delete so, that section in yours. We'll delete that you section. You just blank that out. Uh, we'll take care of that in editing. Um, and, and the problem that we've got is people don't want to pay for software anymore. And I, I get that. Software is expensive. But if we don't follow the standards, then our whole accessibility movement is irrelevant. Because we have to have standards. We have to invest in these standards. And we have to have organizations invest in the standards to make sure that their tools are accessible and available to everyone. Um, another great example of that is Preview in, in uh, iOS and, and um, OSX. Horrible PDF view. Horrible. You know what they do? Strip it out. It's a visual. PDF was designed as a, as a visual representation, but now we have all of this rich access in the back layer to all of this content. But if Apple doesn't care and Google doesn't care, and everyone's saying, hey, look, these tools come for free, and I have it on my iPad, and that's where I want access. But Apple isn't going to give us access to the, to the code layer in the file. We're dead in the water. And stripping out content so that we can view it on mobile devices isn't the answer. You're not going to get that same rich access yet. Anything can happen in the future. But if we don't push the big developers to include this in the same way that PDF UA, the PDF Association, sorry, is pushing Microsoft to build better tools within Word to get over this hump of save, save with tags for accessibility and I'm good to go. If we don't get more feature rich options within our authoring environments, within our screen reading tools, within our braille displays, within our file manipulation, the amount of feature or the number of features that are available within readers, it's huge. It's huge. I can change my PDF to look any way I want within Adobe Reader. I'm not an Adobe guy. I don't work with them. But they're the ones that invest the most in their PDF viewing. And I can go from high contrast to low contrast. I can reflow my content. I can expand my text. I can strip out all of the things that I don't want. I can export it into other file formats. But if we don't keep buying licenses, then these organizations won't invest further into things like Accessibility, which at this point is still seen as ancillary. It's not mandated that they build it in. This is an afterthought for a lot of organizations, which is a horrible, horrible thing, but it's a reality. It doesn't drive business for them in their mind. Having an accessible component is not going to sell them 10 million licenses in their mind. Will it? Yes, it will. We've seen that with iOS. We've seen the movement from people with, with disabilities shifting their mobile approach to iOS VoiceOver is so much better. I still hold out for BlackBerry. And anyone who knows me will laugh at that. Um, but, but this is what we're, we're trying to push with UA. And this is what we're trying to push with, with the standards. We're trying to get people to understand that it's not just making sure that your file is accessible or your web page is accessible. You can do everything you want in HTML and make it accessible and compliant with, with Wiki, and that's great. But if the viewers, aren't giving you access in the same way that we have browser compatibility issues, I would argue this is the same problem. We have browser problems with access to accessible PDF and accessible Word. We had someone, uh, someone was trying to use our new uh, document upload service on our website the other day, and, and she called me and she said, I can't find it on your web page. And I said, really? Like, there's a big green button on every single page that says upload a PDF. 
No, I can't see it. On the right. It's, it's right there. No. How big's your monitor? 13 inches. What? Yeah, 13 inches. It's a CRT monitor. <laughs> what browser are you using? IE7. We have a problem. And that's just it. You can't build for every single use case. We tried. We used WordPress, and it's great. And, and you know, it's responsive design. But if people aren't upgrading their software to read the latest HTML5 compliant web pages, who cares? We gotta meet in the middle. So we need this cooperation of file, viewer, and reader. And that's why the PDF Association invested money into NVDA to say, give us a PDF UA compliant screen reader. It can pick up everything within the standard, make it accessible, make sure that people have access to all of those rich features. But if we don't keep investing in them, donating that money to these companies who are trying to fight the good fight, we won't get there. And that's why this is a business problem. It's not just a social problem, it's a business problem because we need to make sure that the solutions we're coming up with fit within the business process. That's my time. Yeah, can I, can I, yeah five minutes. Five minutes. Um, I can throw it out if, if people would like. If questions, because I think that's my last slide. I can go on about this forever. Anyone? No PDF issues in your organization? Yeah? Yeah, uh, well, about the life cycle forms. Uh, yep. How much is this in the world? Like, how are they just geared towards uh, doing it with HTML5? Actually, no. Absolutely. It's a huge issue. Chrome, Chrome's built-in browser for, for PDF is a huge problem. Lifecycle is an interesting one because most of the accessibility hooks are based off of an HTML or XML framework. So it's it's there. You can actually make a very accessible X, uh, XFA form, right? Lifecycle form. The the challenge that we've got and, and the, the issue that I've got with people not using Adobe Reader for accessing PDF content or Nitro. I mean, it, you've got options. But you have to use the right tool to access the right format. And, and I don't understand the, the challenge with pushing someone to say, like CAD, right? If you're going to open a CAD drawing, you have to use a CAD compliant viewer. So one of the problems that I find with XFA is that it should not be a .pdf file. It should be a .xfa. People assume it's a PDF, I can open it in preview, or I can open it in any other PDF viewer, and it should work. And it shouldn't. It's wrapped into a PDF wrapper because well, Adobe bought JetForms, and, and now we can have it as a PDF, so everyone can access it. Because 10 years ago, really, Reader, uh, Adobe Reader was the only viewer out there. So that was really easy. Today, because PDF is now an open standard and it is not supporting XFA in that standard, organizations like Apple and Google are saying, eh, it's not in there, so I don't care. So the accessibility within XFA, we've done a lot of work with it, no problem. The biggest problem we have is that warning screen that comes up with a non-compliant browser saying, you have to open this in Adobe Reader, but nobody reads that. They just say, hey, the form's not opening broken. Most people won't read the error message to say, oh, I have to open this in Adobe Reader. Absolutely. We did, a, we did a big project with Health Canada last year, and, and they had an 80-page form. It was a nightmare. It was calling out to 12 different databases. It was growing and shrinking, and it was completely dynamic in XFA. And what we did was we did a viewer test. So we, we determined what the file was opening in. And if it, was, if it wasn't opening in Reader or Acrobat, we would show the first page as a static form. And then you could connect to the, the live XFA on the fly, and it would load that file. So it was all built in the same package. But people weren't just given this blank page with a description that says you have to open this in Reader. So there was there was kind of a, a dual authentication process or a single authentication that said 
am I the correct viewer? Yes or no. If I'm not, here's my workaround. And it would, it would force it down. No, it will still be in PDF. I think the difference will be how many developers are going to keep it in PDF versus moving it to HTML. I think that, that becomes the challenge. But again, PDF forms, downloadable, you can't download an HTML form. So there's still that gap where you need an original signature. What are you gonna do? How are you going to pull that information? So I, again, I don't see it going anywhere. Thank you very much, Adam. We're now on to lunch, so I, you know, oh, if there's any, anything else, you know, but. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Excellent. So we have a one hour for lunch. Yes. Lunch is the site. So we'll post the next uh, session.